Okay, and we're live, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board-certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Way to Health. Today, we're talking about POTS and post-concussion syndrome, and I'm joined by Kathy. Good afternoon, Kathy. Good afternoon. All right. So we're talking about POTS, and a lot of you may not know what POTS is. It refers to as postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and it's a condition that's being more and more recognized for people who have fatigue, lightheadedness, and headaches. Now, if you go online and you read about POTS, many of our patients will say, well, you know, I don't match perfectly with having POTS. And, you know, you don't have to. But the fact is, is that POTS can have a variety of manifestations, most notably with some level of dizziness, some level of fatigue, also it can manifest as anxiety. And many of you have been mislabeled as having anxiety when you actually have POTS. So Kathy and I have done a ton of broadcasts on POTS. You can go onto the Gates Way to Health uh, YouTube channel, search POTS within our channel and you'll find a ton of stuff. So that's kind of the introduction. Kathy, anything else you wanted to say? No, I think that pretty much gets it. Um, so we know what POTS is. Mm -hmm. How do you work with POTS? We work with POTS by first figuring out what part of the brain was affected in the head injury. So if you had a concussion and you were completely normal, then all of a sudden after the head injury, you know, your life has changed dramatically. We have to wonder what part of your brain was damaged. We do a full neurological exam. We do a full video nystagmography exam, which is where we evaluate how your eyes move, which tells us a lot about the brain. We may even do specialized types of brain imaging studies to figure out what parts of your brain may be swollen, tracks damage, so on and so forth. Once we determine that, then we actually go into the brain and start stimulating the areas of the brain that were damaged from the head injury. I will say as it pertains to POTS, most notably the cerebellum, which is at the base of the brain, most commonly that's the area that has to have a lot of attention and detail paid to, paid to it um, for POTS. The reason why, and I'm regretting that I didn't grab my brain model in this video, but we'll bring it in for other ones. Your cerebellum sits at the base of the brain. You can Google it, cerebellum. The cerebellum is down here. You have as many brain cells in your cerebellum as you do in the rest of your brain in the cerebral cortex, which is a much greater neurological area, so to speak. Your cerebellum has to filter input from your inner ear. Your inner ear sends about a million signals a second into your brainstem. So each inner ear nerve, your vestibular nerve, sends a million signals a second into your brainstem. That's just at rest. So then if you go and you stand up and you're up and you're moving around and you're turning, that's a lot of inner ear activity that your cerebellum actually has to filter. Well, what if you had a concussion where you hit your head and now your cerebellum is inflamed, it's offline, it's not working as well. Well, in that event, you may not be filtering this inner ear information. The net sum of it is that it can actually drop your blood pressure to where your blood pressure is a little bit lower and as a consequence of blood pressure being down in your legs or your blood volume being down in your legs, you have to secrete more adrenaline to get the blood up to your brain. And when you secrete more adrenaline, that can actually cause feelings of brain fog, that can cause anxiety, that can cause dizziness. So that's why this is so, so, so important and how we work with it, Kathy, to get back to the question, is that we do the brain rehab and we may also give people different exercise strategies to get their heart strong and their brain working with their heart better for those who have post-concussion syndrome and POTS. Okay. How do concussions cause POTS? Pretty much by the damage to the cerebellum. So when we have the cerebellar damage, then that seems to interfere with the communication between the brainstem and the heart and the regulation of blood flow back up to the heart. There is some discussion that concussions are so traumatic and there's so much, there's so many stress hormones that are flowing after a head injury that it will cause uh, autoimmunity. You've heard me talk in other broadcasts about the thyroid uh, becoming an issue after concussions. Well, it, there is some thought that basically after head injury, the immune system is affected and that may be causing POTS as well. Because you can go back and watch Kathy and I's previous broadcast on this, and I'll try to stop hitting the desk because it looks like the cameras are shaking. 
where we mention how a lot of the time POTS is autoimmune. So what they're finding is that between the relay, between the brain and your nervous system and getting blood back up to the heart and then the heart, the immune system can be attacking adrenaline receptors in the heart. The immune system can be attacking the relays, which are called the sympathetic chain ganglia, uh, where acetylcholine binds and that can cause POTS. So all those things have to be assessed in a patient who's presenting with post-concussion syndrome and POTS. That'd be the answer to Is that. The is there, is there a certain type of concussion or injury, I guess I'm asking, that um, because I know we've talked about the concussions a lot and the fact that how how people are hit or what happens, that the, that the neck and everything springs back and that bouncing back. So I'm assuming that's what happens when that when the head goes back, that that cerebellum that gets the damage, yes or no? Yes, and also if there's frontal lobe damage, the frontal lobes communicate to the cerebellum 12 to 14 times a second. So my left frontal lobe talks to my right cerebellum 12 to 14 times a second. So there's a lot of communication going on all the time there. And they've shown, for example, if somebody has a stroke in their left frontal lobe, their right cerebellum will be decreased in its metabolism for two months. It's called diascasis. It's a term not commonly used, but that's what it's referred to, diascasis. So possibly what happens, Kathy, is that somebody, you know, hits the front of their head, you know, some sort of impact injury, car accident, football game, hockey game, headbutting a soccer ball, and then their frontal lobes get affected, and then that affects communi communication to the cerebellum. Okay. Yeah. So what do we look at then? We've got the cerebellum damage. We can have the adrenaline being secreted, which we know causes all sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. What is what? What do we need to do then? I mean, is there a certain regimen that we follow when we're looking at a concussion that's going to pots? I assume this is pretty. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a fine line here. What you go for to take care of the pots part. It's amazing to me how many different things happen because of a concussion. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, there's a protocol, I assume, for this one as well as the others. There is, and the first step is just even recognizing this association. For any post-concussion patient out there who suffers with anxiety, suffers with lightheadedness, dizziness, fatigue, and all your tests are normal, but they're not the right test being run, so you go and you get an MRI, the standard MRI, and it's normal, and doctors say, well, you're fine. But you're like, well, I don't feel fine. Well, a big reason why you may not feel fine is this issue of POTS. And it's just coming out in the literature, and I see it all the time in our patients. They did one study where they took 34 kids with concussions who developed post-concussion syndrome. And they tested them for POTS. 14 out of the 34 had POTS, and another 10 had syncope, which is meaning basically they had low blood pressure, but their heart wasn't beating fast. And it was such low blood pressure that they were passing out. So you can say in essence, 24 out of the 34 had dysregulation of blood pressure after the head injury. That's a huge deal. That's a huge deal for anybody suffering with these symptoms because that in large part could be causing a lot of your post-concussion symptoms. And I say it like that, Trust me, post-concussion syndrome is real, and I only use it that way because so many people, I made quotation marks, Kathy, with my fingers. So many people out there air are told, quotes. yeah, air quotes, they're told that they're crazy. They're told there's nothing wrong with you. Well, there are definitive things wrong with you, and you go back and watch all the recent videos Kathy and I did on concussion because we're trying to bring the legitimacy of this issue to you, and the legitimacy is there, and for anybody who contests that, they're not up on the current science. It may sound like a bold statement, but that is the gosh darn truth. So point being, you got to be checked for POTS. And then once you're checked for POTS, you need appropriate POTS management along with managing your post-concussion syndrome. That's the bottom line. How, what is appropriate? If doing, Go ahead. If we're doing managing, is that is that a long-term thing or do, is that something that we're going to rebound back and, and get to a normal situation in a few months or, or is this a longer, longer uh, term effect that that carries on? Uh, I would say it depends on the situation. The current research shows that if you have post-concussion syndrome for longer than a, basically a year, m most researchers feel that you're going to be stuck with it. It's not going to get better. There's kind of that critical period of, you know, after a month or three months, it's considered post-concussion syndrome. And then for the next 11 to nine months, 
depending on the classification, you're kind of in limbo. So you either get better or you don't. If you don't get better in that time frame, then you really need to start looking into our types of treatments because, or something analogous because there is research actually. In fact, my mentor, Dr. Carrick, he published an article where I think he took a huge group of post-concussion patients three years removed from their injury. So basically these folks were just told, you know, you're gonna have to deal with these symptoms and he got a substantial number of them better and back to functioning. So you can get back to functioning, that's my answer. Kathy, everybody's different and it all depends on the type of management strategy you have. And one of the articles I read relative to POTS, they basically said that if once the POTS is resolved, the post-concussion symptoms largely resolve. So that's a very interesting point. How does this all relate? Well, Kathy and I talked a week or two ago about concussions and, oh geez, it was concussions and eye movements. And there's current research coming out that eye movements can predict if you're going to develop post-concussion syndrome. How does that work? Well, eye movements are heavily integrated in the frontal lobes and the cerebellum. So if you have damage to those areas that Kathy and I are mentioning, your eye movements are going to be off. You're probably going to feel nauseous when you do eye movement testing, which is a sign that that area, your cerebellum, is inflamed. And so these are the areas that need to be rehabbed in order for your POTS to go away, for your brain to regulate your blood pressure so you can feel better. Did that make so sense? So really, the, re the reason we're talking about all this concussion, because we've been talking about concussion for several weeks now. Yeah. And, and the point I'm taking away from all of it is, if you have suffered a concussion, better safe than sorry, deal with it quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let it heal, uh, get the attention that you need at that time, because there can be long-term damaging effects. Yes. And lots of times those long-term damaging effects, you can actually see them with testing if you have the right testing performed. Okay. And we get, when we do these broadcasts, Kathy, we get so many emails from people over the country who are you know, going to doctor to doctor and saying, well, they're telling me my tests are normal. And all I can really say is, well, you're not having the right tests most likely. That's the sad travesty of it. So, well, and, and, that's, that's and that, that is the truth in that so many people don't keep up with the newest technology and the testing that's available i mean okay i went to school and i learned this is what i do for this that's kind of what prevails a lot of times so that if if we have a dr gates who's reading every doggone article that's out there uh that that's a that's a proven article and mm -hmm. proven and tested to show what's going on and that we have results to, to back up everything that's being said then it's important to realize that you know what is it? If it's not broke, don't fix it. But at the same time, if it's not, if it's not fixing you, you better find something that will. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Because there are, as we say, alternatives. And um, I think people are finding out more and more that um, it doesn't hurt. To, like, I mean, the reason you're doing podcasts, people are on the Internet searching for answers right. because they're not finding any. Right. And so often, and like you said, the right scientific articles, trust me, folks, there are articles out there where they're being funded by, let's just say, companies trying to disprove the effects of concussions. They're trying to say that if you have a concussion or post-concussion syndrome, you're faking it. It wasn't because of the injury because, you know, we don't want to be responsible in essence. And I'm not trying to get into some medical legal argument. But the point is, there's a lot of stuff flying back now saying that, you know, if you're an athlete and you're injured, really you're not injured. It's not from the head injury. You were depressed or you're anxious or you had post-traumatic stress disorder before the injury. And really you're just crazy. Well, I'm here to tell you that most of you are not crazy. And if you did have something like depression or anxiety before your head injury, that just means that you were a little more vulnerable for a head injury to cause a neurological issue. Why? Because depression, anxiety patients, lots of times have higher levels of inflammation. They have abnormalities of MTHFR issues like we talked about, uh, Kathy, you know, in other broadcasts. They have issues with production of serotonin. All these different things. They may have obesity. They may have hormonal derangement. So yeah, you hit your head and now you get more severe symptoms after head injury. It doesn't mean that you're crazy or that your depression caused post-concussion syndrome. It just means that you're a little more, more vulnerable for it to happen. Yeah. So it's kind of like piling on. Piling on. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and that's what people need to realize is that 
you know, just because you're anxious or depressed or whatever, yeah, I would say, yeah, if you're in that kind of state, then you have a, a serious brain trauma. Um, yeah. There's all sorts of chemical things that's going to go on between, as, as you always talk about, between your brain, your gut, and the rest of the body. Uh, the computer's fi- not firing the way it's supposed to be, so all the senses are going to be screwed up. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. So I think that pretty well summarizes it. Uh, some of today's information came out of the Journal of Clinical Sports Medicine 2016, also the Journal of Neurological Physical Therapy. There's an article in 2018 on this matter. So all of you science geeks want to go read, check those two articles out. Those were the best ones I found. Again, out of 34 pediatric patients, 14 had POTS and another 10 had syncope, dysregulation of blood pressure. In fact, one last little tidbit, Kathy, they took a huge group of POTS patients, just generalized POTS, and they found that 11% of the POTS patients were due to post-concussion syndrome. So things to pay attention to, guys, and uh, we'll be back next week with more broadcasts. And thanks for joining in, Kathy, after a long day. And You're welcome. Yeah, we'll go from there. Okay. Okay, send us your question, guys. And now, let me see here, end stream, there we go, and we'll end.